Every time you actually ask these questions, you're literally setting up neuroplastic pathways and moving out of the amygdala's responses for survival and moving up into the executive center. This particular topic today is stopping the black and white thinking and rewiring your brain. And so you probably have come across people in your life that have said, uh, my father was not there for me or my mother was not there for me. I would never do that. I'm always there for people. They never did this for me. They were always that way for me. And it's very absolutist. And these absolutisms are not true. I had a woman at one time come to my program in Florida and she said, my mother was never there for me. And I said, your mother was never there for you. I'd like you to think about what you just said. Never there for you. You're a living. She must have been there for nine months. <laughs> well, yeah, she delivered me. Oh, uh, did she breastfeed you? Well, for a while. Did she feed you, bathe you, clothe you, take care of you, take you places? Yeah. So how could you make it never? So let's get more factual. You've made broad generalities that are absolutes instead of a specific thing. Tuesday, you want her to do something and she wasn't able to do it. She had other priorities. You gave her a short notice and she said no. And so you've now exaggerated into she's never there for you. And I made her stop and really reflect on that. And she started to cry and she realized, wow, I can't believe that I've distorted my perceptions of my mom to this degree. I made her go in there and actually look at when her mother was there. I asked her a simple question, just the opposite. Go to a moment where your mother was there for you in, in times where you wanted her. And at first she said she was never there. And I said, now look again. And we started finding all these different moments when she was there. And again, she got tears in her eyes and she realized, why am I doing this? Why am I exaggerating this? I said, because when you have an expectation and if somebody doesn't live up that expectation because you're expecting them to live in your values or expecting them to be one sided, which is not possible. No human being can do that. Uh, you're setting yourself up for a feeling of betrayal and a feeling of letdown. And now you're angry and aggressive and you're, you're, you're distorting your reality with these expectations. But you're blaming her. You have a false attribution bias on hers, thinking she's the cause of your problems. But the real, reality is you've got an unrealistic expectation on your mom and she's trying to juggle with her value systems uh, her life. And she has time for you and two other kids because you have two, two siblings and a husband and a career and a household. And, and so let's get real. And when she finally got past her unrealistic expectation, she had tears in her eyes and started to appreciate her mom. So these absolute statements I found uh, make you non-resilient. Imagine this, you meet somebody and you, you run into them and you think, wow, they're, you're infatuated with them. You think that there's way more positives than negatives and you're conscious of the upsides, you're unconscious of the downsides and you're highly impulsively infatuated with them and seek them out. Then a day, a week, a month, a year, over time, you eventually start seeing downsides to this individual that you were unaware of initially. Your intuition was whispering it to you, but you're unwilling to see it. And you then exaggerated how many positives there are, benefits there are, advantages there are, and got hooked in this infatuation. In fact, you got so hooked at it, it occupied space and time in your mind and ran you for a period of time while you're infatuated. But slowly but surely, little incremental challenges came up and you start seeing the downsides and you you start to see well maybe it's not a hundred percent positive maybe it's 98 96 and 94 and eventually comes to kind of like a 50 50 or there's things i like and things i dislike things are advantage and dis disadvantage then you start to see the individual for who they are and the same thing occur when you resent somebody you're conscious of the downside not conscious of the upside you're blind and ignorant of the upsides and you're labeling them are always negative they're always critical they're always this way or you can't trust them, or they're like every other man. They're these exaggerated statements. And then over time, you eventually discover that, no, that's not true either. And you eventually get the wisdom of the ages, hopefully without the aging process, by looking carefully and finding the other side that you've been ignoring. 
you know, the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. If you ask questions that make you aware of what you're overlooking initially, it liberates you from the infatuations and resentments and impulses and instincts of the amygdala, which is a subcortical area of the brain that's involved in assigning valency and emotional charge to things. And so you can dissolve the charges you have because all those emotional charges get stored in the subconscious mind and run your life and you're not free. And if you're highly polarized and not balanced and synthesized, then these things will run your life. We've all been highly infatuated and you couldn't get the person out of your mind. You've been highly resentful and you couldn't get them out of your mind. So they're running you. Your misperception of them is running you. But if you balance it, you run you. You're poised. You're present. You're now more productive, not distracted. The number one thing that distracts people from living purposefully is their impulses and their instincts, their pleasures, their pains, their, their things that attract them or repel them. And then they're run from the external world. They're extrinsically run instead of intrinsically guided. So these black and white are absolutes. You know, if I was to go to you and I would say, can you think of a time when you puffed yourself up? Yep. And you ever said to yourself, I would never do that. <sighs> That's disgusting what they're doing. I would never do that. Well, what they found in psychology and before psychology even came about, philosophers of the ages. I mean, I can find stuff going back to the Egyptians and the, the Hebrews. And I mean, these are, this is old stuff that whatever we see in other people is a reflection of what we have inside ourselves. We only resent other people because they're reminding us what we're ashamed of in ourselves that we're judging in ourselves, and they're reminding it. That's why we want to avoid them. We want to live in a dissociated fantasy of our, from our shame to live in a fantasy that we're the opposite. That's why we say, when we're really shamed about something that somebody's pointing out that we're seeing in them, we're actually dissociated from that shame. And when we go around, I would never do that because we don't want to feel what it's like to actually judge ourselves. So we have kind of a, a weakness of not willing to handle the truth about our nature. So we've set up a false facade and a kind of a narcissistic fantasy that I would never do that. But the truth is you do. <laughs> I've been taking people through the breakthrough experience, my signature program, and through the Demartini method, my, my methodology, and taking well over 100,000 people just in that program through a method where whatever they perceive in others, they find in themselves. I went through the Oxford Dictionary and found 4,628 individual human behavioral traits in my life. None of it was missing. I was nice, mean, and kind, and cruel, and positive, and negative, and generous and stingy and honest and dishonest. I had every one of the things I found in that dictionary. And uh, when I finally looked honest at myself, I had it all. Nothing was missing in me. But sometimes we don't want to face it. We, we're too frightened of facing it because of some moral hypocrisy that we're trying to live under, that we're trying to be a one-sided individual and not both sides. So anytime we hear ourselves saying, I would never do that, or I always pride myself on doing this. I would never do that. These absolutes are guaranteed to be lies because there is no such thing. If I went up to you and I said, you are always positive, never negative, always kind, never cruel, always generous, never stingy, always peaceful, never wrathful, always giving, never taking, always uh, considerate, never inconsiderate. Your own BS meter inside, your own psychostat, would whisper inside you moments when you've been mean and cruel and, and stingy, you would immediately be thinking of them because you know that's not completely true. And if I said to you, you're always mean, you're never nice, you're always cruel, you're never kind, you're always negative, never positive, you're always the downside, wrathful, never peaceful, always inconsiderate, never considerate, again, you would immediately think of those times when you're nice and considerate and the opposite. Your intuition would always point out the side that would balance out the equation to try to get you back to the center. And you wouldn't believe that. You wouldn't believe if I said you're always nice. You would immediately, if I, I've asked thousands of people, are you, are you always nice, never mean? They go, no. Always mean, never nice? No. But if I say to you, sometimes you're nice, sometimes you're mean, sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, sometimes you're generous, sometimes you're stingy, you would immediately go, yep. You know with certainty that you got both sides. So when we hear ourselves saying, I would never do that, I pride myself on never doing that. I always this way. I'm always positive. I've had people right in front of me believe that they were always positive just after saying a whole bunch of negative things about somebody and gossip. And they couldn't see it. They blinded themselves. Their self-reflection, their introception of themselves 
was so skewed and so subjectively biased that they couldn't even see it. They were untouch, out of touch with their own experience of who they are. So those black and white thinkings are most the sources of the conflicts in the world. When you have somebody that thinks they're right and the other people are wrong, they got an in-group bias and their out-group uh, disconfirmation bias, you might say, and avoidance, then what happens is they're right and the other people are wrong. You see this in politics, you see this in religion, you see this in sociology. You find people that think they're one-sided and they're the right ones and these are the wrong ones. And what's interesting is uh, the pro-lifers think the pro-borders are bad. The pro-borders think the pro-lifers are bad. They both think that they're right when in fact life and death go on in our life regardless of our beliefs. There's life and death. So what we do is we go through life and we go into these polarized, highly extreme, generalized statements about ourselves or other people. And these are non-resilient because if you see somebody all positive and no negative, you're going to fear their loss. If you see them all negative without positive, you're going to fear their gain. If you see yourself all positive and proud, you're going to fear the loss of your pride. And if you feel all shame, you're going to feel the loss, the fear of gain of that uh, shame. But we have a moral licensing effect in our brain. The second we do something proud, we automatically give ourselves permission to do the other side to get us back into the center, to bring us into that balanced state. Our intuition is trying to get us back into that balanced state. So if we allow ourselves to, to go to these extremes, we're non-resilient. We're not adaptable. We're in our amygdala. We're basically in a survival mode. We're basically doing that. And the reason why we do that is very simple. Years ago, thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, potentially, uh, animals, when they saw prey that they wanted to eat, the prey had a camouflage <laughs> and, uh, or some device to try to avoid being eaten. And we had a thing called patternicity. We would look in the environment and look at the pattern and try to see through the camouflage and get the pattern. And then we had another thing called agentisty. We want to see if it's alive. And then we had another thing called pareidolia, which is then we'd look and we'd see a face on it. And then we'd end up going through apophenia. We didn't look at the meaning of it. Is it something predator or prey-like? And then we would end up uh, creating a false positive and negative and a subjective bias into our hormone system in order to get the adrenaline going to run after the prey or run away from the predator. So when we're in survival mode, we have to distort things. But that's not what's actually there. That's just a survival mechanism to make sure we capture prey and avoid predator. Our daily life isn't prey and predator all day long. We have minor little gradations of support and challenge going on, things that we are pleased or displeased by, but not these absolutes. So we don't need that type of response, but when we hear our response like that, we're non-resilient. We're not adaptable. And we basically end up black and white. And the black and white thinking like that is the one that causes the conflict between the, the extremists that are the pro-lifers are extremely going against the pro-aborters. In fact, there was a gentleman a number of years ago that actually shot people at, a, at an abortion clinic, went and shot everybody there because he was tired of them killing people. <laughs> oh, you know, it's kind of a yin-yang. Whatever your disowned part is, you attract to teach you how to love that part of yourself. So I'm not here to try to promote an extreme. I, I think that what that does is it creates a non-resilient, non-adaptable, absolute illusion. And that's where most of our conflicts are, internal or external conflicts. What I teach in the Breakthrough Experience, my signature program, is how to ask questions to see past our survival mentality, to enter into a world where we see things as they are, not as they first appeared, and allow us to see, if we see something we're infatuated, to, to ask what are the downsides? And if we see something we're resenting, what are the upsides? If we are cocky and proud, instead of waiting for hubris to come along and people to criticize us to get us back down in equilibrium, that if we don't control ourselves, we get control from the outside, we ask questions to humble ourselves, to give ourselves back into authenticity. Because when we're in a state of pride, we're not authentic. We're in a state of shame, we're not authentic. When we're infatuated, we're, that's not an authentic view of them. When we're resentful of them, that's not an authentic view of them. We're not living in a state of authenticity. What's interesting is everybody wants to be loved for who they are, but most of the time we're too busy judging and too busy exaggerating and minimizing ourselves to ever experience that. So in the Breakthrough Experience, I teach people how to ask questions to bring those polarities back into balance so you things, see things as they are, not as you generalize them and subjectively bias them into being for survival. 
And that gives you more resilience and more adaptability and more love and appreciation for yourself as yourself. And you don't have to fix yourself. See, if you infatuate with somebody, you're going to want to sacrifice you to be like them. When you resent somebody, you're going to want to sacrifice them to be more like you. Neither one of those are anything but futile. If you want to have utility, not futility, learn the art of loving people and having resilience and adaptability and to appreciate their uniqueness, but no, exaggerate them. They're not, nobody's worth putting on pedestals or pits. Nobody's an ultimate saint or sinner. I love what Abraham Lincoln said. If they're not much of a saint, I mean, if they're not much of a sinner, don't expect them to be much of a saint. There's always a pair of opposites inside people. We've had enough heroes go down and be, we get to discover people we thought were heroes. They find the other dark side, as they call it. But there's always two sides to people. I'm not a nice person. I'm not a mean person. I'm a human being where if you support my values, I can be nice. If you challenge my values, I can be mean as a tiger. I'm a human being. And a human being has both sides. Of all the traits, you know, as Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher that said that, you know, there's pairs of opposites and they always come in pairs. And there's a unity between them. And a wise individual sees the synthesis and the unity between them. And that's what I teach in the Breakthrough Experience, how to discover the center. If you want to be centered and you want to be poised and you want to be present, you want to be powerful, you want to be purposeful, productive, patient, and prioritized, it's learning how to get objective and learning how to be able to see both sides of things simultaneously. So I ask quality questions in the Demartini Method at the Breakthrough Experience. I teach people how to ask quality questions to be able to see things they're blind to so they can see both sides so they're not reactive, they're proactive. Because when you're infatuated, you're reactive. You've got to have, you got to have the person. When you're resentful, you've got to get away from the person. They're running you. The second you actually see both sides, you get to love the person. Love the individual for who they are as an individual. And you don't run around with absolute black and white thinkings. You rewire the brain. And every time you actually ask these questions, you're literally setting up neuroplastic pathways and moving out of the amygdala's responses for survival and moving up into the executive center. And you're actually myelinating. The, the glial cells in the brain are literally myelinating and stimulating new spines and dendrites and pathways in the brain. And you're rebuilding your brain for a more productive, more accurate, and more wise, objective view on life. So you're setting real expectations in real time with real objectives that give you real results. That's why I tell people to come to the Breakthrough Experience so they can learn the science of how to break through those subjective biases that most people are trapped in. Every week people come to the Breakthrough Experience, they really resent somebody. And they'll come in and say, well, my boyfriend or my ex-boyfriend is a narcissist. Well, that's a label. It's interesting. You dated him for how many years? Well, 12 years. Okay, 12 years you were with a narcissist? That's kind of irrational. You sure you want to put a label on him like that? No, he's a narcissist. I said, well, you stayed with him for 12 years. It seems like now that you're challenged by him and now he's pushing your buttons and now you're not getting what you want from him, which is narcissistic, you're now labeling him narcissistic. And he's now doing that to you. You're both labeling that now that your values are being challenged so strongly. You sure that's who they are? Let's go looking different, more deeply. And they go in there and identify what it is that they're judging them for. And they go find out where they've done it in themselves, their own life. And they go find out the benefits to it. And they find out where the benefits of where they've done it. And they go in there and find out where that individual does exact opposite traits to break the labels. And they take the absolutes out. And they go in and find out at the moment they're doing it, who's doing the other side of it. Because there's always two sides to every perception. Because all perceptions are contrast. And then they ask, I ask the question, if they were to do it the way you hoped they'd have been, what would have been the drawback to you to crack the fantasies that you were comparing them to? Because you're holding on to your own fantasies and projecting onto them, and they can't live up to it because it's unrealistic. And then you end up labeling them. And then once they're done, they're sitting brought into tears, and they realize that this individual is a magnificent individual that's been a contribution to their life, and they're finally saying thank you for it instead of sitting there and having a label on them. Our psychologist out there and all kinds of people, counselors, want to put labels on people, diagnostic labels. But I don't find those to be true. I've taken over 100,000 people through the Breakthrough Experience and done the Demartini Method on them. And I asked people, how many of you started with a label here? And we started with the most resented individual or most admired individual they can think of. And when we're done, it's dissolved. And all of a sudden, they realize it's just a human being that's contributed to life. And the very individual that you thought was somebody to hate and resent was your teacher teach you how to love yourself and to be authentic and to be able to go through life and not in survival. When you finally realize that, you realize why I tell people to come to the Breakthrough Experience. 
because there's probably in your life, I ask people, how many of you probably have other people in your life that you probably have skewed views like that? Every hand goes up. I said, well, if you want to live that way and be unresilient and constantly have these people run your life and be avoiding people and seeking people and being hooked by those things all the time and reacting and gossiping around it, instead of getting focused on what's really meaningful to your life, fine. But if you want to break through that and transcend that and get on with a meaningful and inspiring life, come to the Breakthrough Experience. Because I'm absolutely certain the methodology that I've developed over the last 50 years is a science. It's reproducible. It's duplicatable. If you hold yourself accountable and you answer the questions just as instructed, you're going to dissolve those resentments, those infatuations, those prides, those shames, those griefs, those uh, unrealistic expectations you've got on yourself and other people, all those labels you've got on yourself, you know, a sabotaging, limited beliefs, all that, all that stuff is simply an incomplete awareness. And if I ask you the right questions and hold you accountable to it, which I do in the program, all that noise and all that literally noise, a static in your consciousness is free. Your signal to noise ratio changes. You start to communicate from the heart what's inspiring to you and live your life more fully. You can live an inspired life, <laughs> but you're not going to do it in black and white thinking. And you'll see that the densest individuals, the most dense individuals are usually in the legal uh, system. They're basically sitting there in a court of law with black and white, right and wrong and everything else. You'll notice it's a densest energy. It's almost a futility. It just pay, you pay the lawyers to argue for something, to hold on to your position, instead of actually learning how to lighten up and be able to love and appreciate and see both sides and reflect. Highest level of awareness is reflective awareness where you see whatever you see in others you have and you, you're seeing yourself. So if you want to go and transcend that dense level, that conflict-oriented level, the internal conflict and paradox level, and want to get on to something more transcendent to that, come to the breaks experience. Because I don't care what it is. There's nothing your mortal body can experience that your immortal, real authentic soul, you might say, can't love. You have the capacity to love pretty well anything that's happened in your life. People think, well, this has happened to me and that's the reason I'm not, I'm angry. No, whatever happens to you, it's your perception, your decision and your action that counts. And I can show you how to take command of your perception, decision, action, take no matter what's happened in your life and turn it into something that's fuel and opportunity and see it on the way, not in the way. Instead of having black and white thinking and being labeling things and blaming people and being caught, which is one of the very common things I find in cancer patients, they're very black and white uh, labeling oriented, which runs the immune system down, makes them non-resilient, shuts down the advanced acquired immune system activates the primitive immune system, the innate immune system, which is more primitive. We don't have the surveillance cells on the cancer cells. We don't have the, the, the immune system functioning as we would like to have it. And we take a risk going through life. And we basically help our physiology create signs and symptoms to teach us how to love the people we haven't been able to love in our life. So I could go on for a long time on this topic, but I think I've said pretty well enough here. But I just want to say that that if you come to the Breakthrough Experience, I can show you a methodology that you will use the rest of your life that will transform a lot of the baggage you may be carrying around unnecessarily and lighten it up and give yourself permission to go out and do something with your life that's meaningful. I don't want you to be stuck in an absolute world. Black and white thinking is not where it's at. That's not, that's not how you do it. I, when I see people that are stuck that way, you see them very rigid. You've met them. You know what I'm talking about. You've probably had moments. I've had moments like that too. And we basically are lying about what's going on and we're not seeing the whole. I'd much rather see the whole picture, not be caught in subjective biases that are extreme and get back into the center and center ourselves and love ourselves. That's why I tell people to come to the Breakthrough Experience. Do the, the value determination to live by highest priority, which increases objectivity, which decreases the probability of that emotional extreme, and learn the Demartini Method so I can show you how to dissolve that so you can clear out the baggage you've been carrying around for years. I have people sometimes resenting people for years, decades, or in fact with, with fantasies, they keep hooking themselves in the same type of relationship. I've seen this affect our mind and our, our noise in our mind. I've seen it affect business. I've seen it affect our finances. We keep getting hooked by quick get rich schemes, which is a symptom that we've got in black and white thinking. We think we're going to get rich quick. Instead of immediately uh, immediate gratification, you want a long-term vision and pay investments and buy quality companies that serve people. So I've watched people come into the breakthrough experience with all kinds of reasons in every one of the seven areas of life, their social life, their business, their health. And I show them how to dissolve the emotional baggage that's underlying some of the stresses and distresses that they're facing in their life. 
you don't have to do that so just want to share that for this weekend this week <laughs> this uh, message for the week and i just tell you come to the breakthrough experience I, I i spent 30 minutes with you here i spend literally 25 hours with you in the breakthrough experience and i help people one 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 help them break through limitations and show them how to use a tool the rest of their life so take advantage of that come and join me for that and also go to the website make sure you do your value determination and go live by priority and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for being with me this week. I look forward to seeing you at the next break too. Thank you.